So again, um, this is the third class on Hasidic ideas on Pesach. Uh, we will have one more during Cholamoy. Today will be, um, at the moment, probably the final class with the Sfat Emet. Uh, that's uh, Rabbi Yehuda Leib um, Alter, uh, used to be Rotenberg. The officially third Rebbe of Gur, his grandfather was the fa the Chidush Yarim was the founder of the Gur Hasidim and a disciple of and a colleague of Menachem Mendel of Kotzk and a disciple of the Chos of Lublin. And uh, but his father died when he was quite young, so in a sense he's almost like the next uh, Rebbe after him. So um, hello everyone. I will read. There's one keta here, one paragraph I'd like to read and talk about concerning the holidays and um, <clears throat> and uh, I'll do that just in a moment I'll just give one more minute I think for people to find their way <clears throat> onto this event okay Um, I wasn't sure how I could actually put the literature in front of you. I know in the Zoom you can do it here, you cannot, but then I will just read it myself and translate. He's talking about the three festivals. Remember, Passover is the first of the pilgrim festivals. Shalosh Regalim. Shalosh Regalim. You know, of Nachman of Breslov, who was very much into trying to understand all the symbolic significances of every little detail in life he used to say that if you're having a problem walking if you fall you stumble and you hurt your leg then you have to check to see if you celebrated the previous festival correctly because every festival is called a regel which means a lay a leg and it's also called a moed which means a consecrated time but in hebrew moed also means to stumble so if you stumbled on your leg, then you probably did not do something correct in the previous festival. So Nachman was all for looking for these connections for things. Of course, as we know, looking for the connections sometimes is a little bit dangerous. You could uh, land up at the wrong conclusions. Hello, everybody. Hello, Heather. Hello, Iris. Hello, Anne. <clears throat> and uh, welcome for and Stan, and welcome for joining. Okay, so I'm going to read. So remember, Pesach is the first of the three um, pilgrim festivals, Shalosh Regalim. Now, the Sfatimet, the Rebbe of Gor says that the three festivals, Hem Keneged Bechinat Dibur, um, Bechinat Dibur Machshava, Dibur Maase Machshava. The three festivals represent speech, action, and thought. As you can understand, Passover will be speech. So we'll see in a moment. So Passover will be speech. Shavuot will be thought, the giving of the Torah. And remember, we have a custom to study all night. And action will be Pesach. So we'll see this in a moment. Ki Pesach niftach shal ish Israel, Because on Passover, the mouth of the the Jewish mouth is open of every person of the Jewish people. Vadibur, and it gives us the possibility of speech. That's why the word Pesach can be broken up into two words. This is already mentioned by um, Rabbi Yishai Horvitz of Prague in the 16th century in his Shnei Chotabrit, that Pesach can be broken up into two words. It's Pesach, which means the mouth that speaks, from the word Sicha, the mouth that speaks, Pesach. So, <clears throat> Pesach, Lachin Yitkan Megillat Shira Shirim, and that's why out of the five scrolls, every scroll is associated to another holiday. Shira Shirim is associated with Passover. That's why we have a minag of reading Shira Shirim on the Shabbat of Cholamoy to Pesach. Some people read Shira Shirim even after the Seder. And this is in addition to the custom that the Sephardim have to read it every um, Erev Shabbat. So, 
כדכתיב במדרש, נשיר למי שעשענו שירים בעולם. Like the Midrash says, why is it called Shir Asherim? The Song of Songs. We will sing songs to the to He has made us a song in this world. As it says, Amzu Yatzartili, we read in the Haftorah a week and a half ago, this people have I created for me, Tihila Tiyasaperu, they shall tell my glory. So, Passover is called speech. He says, because the word Pesach sounds like Pesach, the mountain that speaks. And also you have Shira Shirim, which is a song of songs. Singing, of course, is something which is like speech, but with a tune, etc. And we're also called the people of God who tell his glory. There's actually more to it than just that. The Zohar says um, that when the Jewish people were enslaved in Egypt, the power of speech was in exile. This idea of the power of speech being in exile means that a slave does not have an identity. To be a slave means to lose your concept of independent identity. You become like a number, like an object. So the Jewish people in Egypt have lost their identity. They are called speechless because speech is the expression of thought. So it's the first idea of identity. So losing the power of speech, symbolic, it means losing your identity. So the Jewish people losing their power of speech in Egypt um, because they become enslaved, right? And that's why the whole book of Exodus is called in Hebrew, not Exodus, it's Yad Mitzrayim, but it's called Shmot, which is names, the ability to give names and identities. If you remember Adam, when he saw the animals, he felt it was his duty to give names to the animals, to create an identity for all the animals. Therefore, Moses, and the word Moshe in Hebrew is the same letters as Hashem, the name, is the one who represents this idea of giving names of the Jewish people, returning the power of speech to the Jewish people, helping them return their identity. And in a sense, Moses gives a name to God because he says at the beginning of Shemot, if they ask me, what is your name? Mashmo, what should I tell them? And God says, Eheye, Asher, Eheye, I will be which I will be. And tell them, Eheyesh Lachania Lechem, tell them, I will be has sent you. So Moses even finds a name for God to relate to the Jewish people. So Moses is all about looking for identities and creating actual uh, individuality and, and national identity as well. By the way, Rav Cook writes about uh, the meaning of freedom. What does it mean to actually to be free? To be free means to be yourself. That's why the matzah is a representative of the idea of redemption of freedom. It's got, because the matzah is the dough without leavening, without yeast, without something forcing it into a mold. So it actually can just be itself. So therefore, you have this rep rep representation of the Matzah being freedom. In general, in the Seder, we recline when we have symbols of freedom. The matzah is one of those symbols, and the four cups of wine, or the four which represent the four expressions of redemption, is another such symbol in which we recline. So, <clears throat> therefore, Pesach represents speech. As he said, Pesach. Shavuot. Now, in the Torah, the holiday of Shavuot, of course, is called the holiday of the harvest, Chag Katsir. It's also referred to as the holiday of the Bikurim, or the first fruit, because the first fruit can be brought from Shavuot until Sukkot. So, but in our tradition, the Talmud says in Shabbat, that not only is Shavuot the celebration of the harvest and the Bikurim, but it also happens to be the day that God gave, said, spoke the, the Decalogue, what we refer to as the Ten Commandments, Aseret Advarim. And therefore, rabbinically, we refer to Pesach as Zman Matan Toratenu, the day our Torah was given. The truth is, it's actually not the Torah that was given. Shalom, shalom. It's not the Torah that was given, it was actually the Decalogue, it was the Ten Commandments. <clears throat> the Torah, even the Luchot, even the tablets, were only brought 40 days later, and then Moses, of course, broke them on Shiva Savatamus, 
and then went up again and again until he brought them eventually on Yom Kippur, on the 10th of Tishrei, the second tablet. When the Torah actually was written, according to our, according to the Talmud, it's a, it's a dispute, but the, according to the opinion that it's Migila, Migila, Nitna, or, or even the, according to Rashim Bayochai, according to both opinions, it's finished by the end of the 40 years of the desert. In any event, rabbinically, Shavuot is considered Zman Matan Torah. Tenu, because of that, we spend the night studying Torah. And it's called Machshava, it's called thought. By the way, why do we spend the night of Shavuot studying Torah? Why not the day? The idea is because the Talmud says that the Torah was given Shabbat morning at 10 o'clock in the morning. Sounds funny, but that's what it says. And it also says that Moses woke, woke it actually says in scripture, Moses woke them up. Because the Jews went to sleep the night before, because you would think if you're receiving the Torah, you'd be so nervous, you wouldn't be able to fall asleep. The fact that they fell asleep was not considered um, something meritorious, but let's put it that way. And therefore, in order to make up for this, we spend the night studying Torah the night before in anticipation of the Torah, which symbolically will be given again Shavuot morning as we read the Aser Tadibrot, as we read the Ten Commandments in the Torah on, in the morning. So Shavuot is called thought, machshava, vehadat, shu kabbalat Torah, and the knowledge which is the receiving of Torah. Ubisukot, and the third pilgrim holiday, which is called Sukkot, Tabernacles, this represents action. As it says, and you shall take for you, you shall take on the first day, um, a nice fruit, which we interpret, of course, as the etrog, uh, the citron, the uh, kapot marim, and the palm branch, the anafet zavod, and the branch of an avot tree, which we, our tradition is a myrtle, the arve nachal, and willows, and these are things that we take and we wave them on Shavuot and we build our sukkah. So in Shavuot, there's really a lot of action. So, um, and we also sit in the sukkah. And we go around every day with our lulav and etrog around the bima. And in the Beit HaMikdash, it was around the altar. And the fact that we shake our lulav in different directions, which is all different movements of the body, so therefore, Sukkot represents action. Again, Pesach represents speech, Pesach, and the idea, of course, symbolically, regaining of the identity. The slaves have the loss of speech, according to the Zohar, and we regain our, our identity. This is called regaining speech. That's Pesach, which is speech. That's why in the Seder, first of all, you have Arba Lashonot Shul for um, expressions or sayings of redemption. You have the four kashas, you have the four questions, which are also in speech. You have the four sons who ask four questions. And then, of course, we have a mitzvah on that evening to talk about the Exodus story. We get it to that you're supposed to actually tell the Exodus story on that day to the next uh, generation. So <clears throat> Pesach represents um, speech. Shavuot represents thought and Sukkot represents action. Now, normally when we think of the way things go, right, thought is first in the hierarchy, speech is second in the hierarchy, and action is if it's third. Um, in Kabbalistic writings, uh, the idea of speech and actions are called levushim. They are the enclosement of your thought, which means my thought is inner, my speech is outer, it's an expression of my thought, so it's almost like an external enclosement. It's an external expression of my thought. And action is also an expression of my thought and actually of my emotions, of both, but it's definitely an expression of my thought in an external way. So the speech and the action are actually two external expressions of thought, which is something which is internal. However, when we're talking about the pilgrim holidays, the Shalosh Regalim, we do have a process here. First of all, we have a process in nature. Process number one is Pesach. Pesach is a spring, which is the revival of plant life after the, it was dormant during the winter. 
So the idea of the renaissance of life, of the beginnings, of new beginnings is Pesach. And it's a new beginning for the Jewish people who entered Mitzrayim, who entered Egypt as 70 individuals, a very large family, and came out as a people, as Paro already realized, this people of this nation of Israel is going to outnumber us. So Paro realized that the Jewish people are a nation and not just individuals. So Shavu, so then Pesach represents beginnings, like the plant life. That's why it's called Chag Ha'aviv, the festival of the spring, it's a new beginning. Shavuot, which represents Katsir, the idea of harvesting. First the plants grow and then you harvest them. That's like the Torah, which is being harvested and given to us by God as a present, now that we have reached a certain point of maturity. And then Sukkot is called the ungathering of the crops, Chag Ha'asif. And in the same vein, it also represents this idea of uh, Sukkot Shalom, which is the canopy of peace, which is an expression for the temple. Well, it's also God's canopy of peace, but also we say on every day of Sukkot, Arachamanu Yakim Lanud Sukkot Davin Anofelet, may God rebuild the Sukkah of David, and the Sukkah that we build for ourselves, in a sense, represents the Sukkah of David. So that's the ingathering of the crops or ingathering of the Jewish people into the land of Israel. So in that sense, agriculturally, the process matches the ideas behind the holiday. But his new idea here of thought, uh, excuse me, of speech, thought, and action, well, we would have to explain it like this. As I said, speech, in this case, represents the identity. The Jews gain an identity through leaving Egypt. They become their own nation. And Moses really instructs us how to gain that identity. As we start gaining our identity, we receive the Torah as a guideline. It's hard to receive a guideline and guidance when you don't have any feeling of identity of who you are as an individual. Shavuot represents thought, and then Sukkot is action. So in the sense that trying to teach the guidelines, which is called thought, and eventually Shavuot is, excuse me, Sukkot is called the action after the thought is clear, then you have to make the guidelines of which direction you want to go. So, the Hagimah Regalim, the three pilgrim festivals, I'm reading, by the way, Sfatimet on Passover. It's in his book on Vayikra, um, page Lamadal and Amud, Amud Aleph. It's called, it's 34a. And the three pilgrim festivals, the three Regalim, Notim Chiyut Ubracha Lekol Hashanah, they give vitality and blessing for the rest of the year. Kamosh Katuv, as we say in the uh, Musaf service and also in Shacharit, actually, of the festivals, V'hasiyenu birkat mo'adecha, bestow upon us the blessing of your festivals. Kasheratzita, the way you wanted to do this. Shalzen yiknor galim, because for this reason did we receive the festivals that God can bestow upon us the blessing of the festivals. She'az b'nei Yisrael muchanim l'kebel ha'brachot. Because then the Jewish people are ready to receive the blessing. You have to want the blessing. You have to ask for it to receive it. It doesn't just fall in your hands. You have to jump, and then you'll catch it. L'chayni m'chuvanim. Therefore, these three pilgrim holidays, Shalosh Galim, m'chuvanim k'nege g'mo brachot. Because they bring blessing in into our lives, they also represent the three blessings of the priestly benediction. Birkat Kalanim. The first one is, Yevarechacha Hashem Yishmarecha. May God bless you and watch over you. And that has to do with Passover, because it says to watch over you. And Passover is called the guarded night, Leil Shumurim, when God watched over the Jewish people and then passed over, and the, of course, the angel of death smote the firstborn of the Egyptians. Ya'er, Hashem Panav Elecha Bichuneka, may God um, shine his light upon us um, and be gracious unto us. So Ya'er, to shine the light, is on Shavuot, which is a light of Torah. 
Isa, may God raise his countenance towards you and give you peace. And this represents Sukkot because the Sukkah is called Sukkot Shalom, the Sukkah of peace. So therefore, the third benediction of the, the priestly benediction is, is the festival of Sukkot. So all the three parts of the priestly benediction of Birkat Kohanim represent the three holidays. And in each one of the holidays, we are requesting these blessings. On Passover, we are requesting Shmirah to be guarded. And we definitely needed this Pesach to be guarded against various plagues that are trying to take out over our lives. As a certain doctor in New York said online on a video I heard this past week, he said, we're in World War III now. It's the virus against humanity. So we have to win, basically. So anyhow, so we ask for God's protection, and which is called Leo Shumarim, and that's called Yevarech Hashem Yishmarecha. Ya'er Hashem, God's shining His countenance upon us and being gracious unto us. Vichuneka, that's called Shavuot. And Shavuot, God shines His countenance through the giving of the Torah, which we go through the motions again on the Shavuot holiday. And God bestows His peace on Sukkot, which is called the Sukkah of Shalom. So we have to strengthen ourselves during these holidays. As we say in the, in the davening, remember us on these days for the good. And also let our memory come before you. And save us, bring us salvation on these holidays. Because God remembers all these days, all these holidays. That's why they're called Moadei Hashem. They are called the set, the set times, God's set times during the year. The term Moed means a, a meeting in a time and in a place. So the fact that that's why you had Ohel Moed, the tabernacle was called the tent of the special times, special time and a special place. So the Moadim also are special times that happen. So Moed is like special. Uh, times the Mishkan was in a special place, and the Moedim were special times, the holidays. And therefore, we ask God to include us uh, within this. Just as you're remembering the holidays, and you're remembering everyone, remember us both individually and nationally. Because time itself um, is also looking. For what to do? It says in the Midrash, Darkid Sion Mevakshin Tafkidam, that the ways to Zion are looking for its um, its um, purpose. And as it says, Vaidaber Moshe Moadei Hashem of Bnei Israel, Shit Kasher Liot Vekim Bnei Israel Be'ela Yamin. It says, and Moses spoke these holidays, these special times of God to the children of Israel. What does it mean? Shehit kasher, that he connected to them in order that the Jewish people connect to these holidays. Because during these days, God is, remembers us. And we have the special ability to connect to him during these days. Just as God remembers these days, it's the possibility again of receiving blessing and receiving connection during these days, uh, which are called Moadei, uh, Moadei Hashem. The special times of God. So the the Moadim, therefore, the festivals are a bit different than a Shabbat. <clears throat> a Shabbat is holy, intrinsically holy. The festivals are in them are called Kriye Moed, which means things which are called holy. Actually, the Svatamet explains what does that mean? The intrinsic holiness is of, of the, is the Sabbath. And the festivals receive their holiness from the Sabbath. That's why they're called Kriyemoid. However, in another sense, Talmudically, the festivals are called Kriyemoid because of the fact that these are the festivals which you call, uh, you are supposed to give the name, uh, the appellation, and call them the sanctified days because the Beidin has the ability to decide 
by testimony whether the previous Hebrew month was 29 or 30 days. So in a sense, we have a way of actually deciding, in a sense, by testimony and the Beitin, of when the festival is going to fall, whether on the 14th, the 15th, or the 16th, depending on when, 14th or 15th, excuse me, the 15th or 16th, depending on whether the previous month was 29 or 30 days. Uh, the Talmud in, in Beitza says that the idea of the Moadim is Chetzio Lashem and Chetzio Lachem, as opposed to Shabbat, which is all Kodesh Lashem, all sanctified to God, and therefore representing the futuristic times of um, Olam Shukulo Shabbat, the day which is a day which is totally the Sabbath. The holidays which are given for this world are half yours and half God. They're this meaning point between time and sanctity. Uh, the Vilna Gon says that, I think it's brought in Kol Eliyahu, if I remember correctly, you have the seven days, uh, excuse me, you have the Sabbath, Sabbath is the seventh day of the week, and the holidays, there are seven holidays, where each holiday um, is represented by as if a day of the week. So, the seven holidays are, and I'm talking about the holidays as they are in the Torah. In the Torah, Rosh Hashanah is one day. Today we 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 do it as two, but it says Yom Torah, a a day of blowing the shofar. Right. So originally Rosh Hashanah was one day in the Torah, and then you have I'm going to skip over Yom Kippur for a moment because it's Yom Kippur, which is the Shabbat Shabbaton. So you know what? Let's start from yeah. So Rosh Hashanah, then you have Sukkot is seven days, meaning seven days, and then Shmini Atzeret. So, but not all those days are Yom Tov. Again, it's the Yom Tovs which are seven. One day Rosh Hashanah. The first day of Sukkot is a Yom Tov. Shmini Atzeret is a Yom Tov. We're up to three. The first day of Passover is a Yom Tov. The last day of Passover is a Yom Tov. One day of Shavuot is a Yom Tov. And finally, the seventh one is Yom Kippur, which is called Shabbat Shabbaton the Sabbath of the Sabbath. So if the Yamim Tovim are called the Sabbaths of the year, then Yom Kippur is a Sabbath, meaning a seventh, the Sabbath of the Sabbaths. And, um, but Shabbat itself is a separate entity. It's also a separate cycle. Because remember, the holidays are the cycle of the, of the seasons and the agricultural year, whereas the Shabbat happens every seven days. It's, it's just a cycle by itself which is not affected neither by the seasons or the agricultural year. By the way, because the festivals are um, built on the concept of the agricultural year, because this is where the human element comes in contact with the divine element here, that's why Sukkot, the Sukkot holiday, interestingly enough, is called Kufat Hashana, which means the time when the year restarts. A new episode. <clears throat> Why is that? Because the Sukkot holiday is the end of the agricultural year. The agricultural year started in Pesach, which was the spring, and things grow. Then you had Shavuot, which was the harvest. And Sukkot is the end of the agricultural year when you ingather the crops into the barn, to wherever you're putting it. And so it's Kufat HaShanah, it's the end of that cycle. Then you have the winter. Then the cycle starts again in the spring. So it's as if the, the festivals are a cycle which go for six months, from Pesach until Sukkot, which is the agricultural cycle in the land of Israel. Of course, that's also uh, the time when we don't have the water, we don't have the cold um, in Israel. So this is the first uh, thing I wanted to read to you from the uh, Safat um, this idea of, now let's try to understand it a little bit more. So first he says the holidays represent machshava dibur maaseh. This idea of machshava dibur maaseh, thought, speech, and action, you will find in the Tanya, you'll find in Chaim Volozhin's Nefesh Chaim, something which is, in other words, you'll find it among the Hasidim and the Midnagdi. And as I said, it's an unusual way of portraying a human being, uh, because really, thought, you, when we think of a human being, we think of thought, emotions, and actions. But in the Kabbalistic understanding of a human being, they're the inner midot or the inner attributes, and that there's the expressions of these attributes. 
So in the Kabbalistic way of thinking of the human being, what we call Ilana Sfirot, so the attributes of the head, which are called the um, which are called the intellectual attributes, which are wisdom, intelligence, and knowledge, are all centered in the head. It's called the right brain, the left brain. Wisdom is the right brain. Um, the left brain is called intelligence, and then the uh, cerebellum in the back is called knowledge. And then you have, of course, um, the seven lower sefirot, which start off with love, on the, which is the right hand, and fear, which is the left hand, and mercy, which is the heart. And those are the main emotions out of the seven. And uh, so therefore you have, uh, and then you have lower emotions too. But in the point is that you have in the head the thought and you have the emotions um, in, the, in the heart. Um, sometimes this is considered a breakdown like the temple. In the temple, you have the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was. That rep represents the head. And just like between the Holy of Holies and the middle part of the temple, there was a curtain. So too, between the head and the main part of the torso, the main part of the, the body, you have the neck, which is sort of like the curtain, the division. Then from the neck down until the diaphragm, which is the next division, you have uh, the heart, but you also have, if you remember in the temple, you had three things in the Heichal, in the oracle, in the middle part of the temple. You had the menorah, which represented light. You had the incense altar, and you had the showbread table. So, the idea of the light represents the heart. Very often in the Bible, the heart is the light, is actually called the, under, the heart of understanding. It's interesting, in biblical thinking, it's not just the brain that understands, it's also the heart, right? An understanding heart, lev me vin, libo doeg bikirbo, a worried heart, an understanding heart. That's called the menorah, which is the light of wisdom. And then, of course, the incense altar, which is something you breathe in, represents the lungs. And then the showbread table represents, of course, the stomach, which processes the food. And then the diaphragm is the second separation. And then in the third part of the temple, where the korbanot were brought, where you have the offerings, the animal offerings, is the more animal part of the human being, which is, of course, the sexual organs, and also the getting rid of the things that the body is trying to get rid of. So this represents the more animalistic side of the human being, and that represents the third part, the azara of the temple, where the animal offerings uh, were brought. So the human being, in a sense, it also is broken up to the three parts of um, the temple. So what is speech and action? Speech and action, if machshava, if thought, is our most, the inner part of the human being, and even in thought, you have two types of thought, right? I mean, you have thought, which actually, actually works, in a sense, by words, in a sense, primordial words, which are our thought processes within our brain, but, and then they come out in speech, which is one of the externals, that's why it's a levouche, it's almost like enclosement of something internal, and action, which we use our body to do this action, is also something which is an expression not only of our thought, but our emotions too. Our speech can also be an expression of our thought and our emotions too. So these are called levushim, these are things which are a little bit more external to the person. So getting back to this idea, we have machshava dibur maseh, but he's saying like this, the three holidays, as I said, Passover is speech, it's the idea of identity, and Shavuot is thought, receiving in the Torah, and Sukkot is action, and again, what does that mean? <clears throat> when we try to restart, and reboot. Everything starts with thought. We have to understand what our position is. We have to use our ideas and try to implement them in the right way, but that all starts with thought. But in the 
in the, in the sense of what happened in Egypt, first you need speech, not speech as expression of the thought, but speech as creating identity. As I said, according to the Zohar, the meaning of speech in the context of Pesach was the lack of identity of the slave, the need to gain some type of identity. You can see this with children as they grow up. First they learn to talk, only later they learn to think. <laughs> you learn to talk, you can talk pretty well at the age of two. You can say no, 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 no. Officially, the beginning of formal logic, I mean, children start to think at six, that's time of chinuch, but formal logic really only starts between 11 and 13, which is what we call bar and bat mitzvah, 12 and 13. So yes, they learn how to talk, but actually formal logic and thinking actually only happens later. So when we think of a process of maturation, of growing up, so first comes speech because that's called looking for your identity. So Pesach means looking for your identity. Shavuot then is a thought process of where do I want to go? And then Sukkot is how do I implement it into my house, my Sukkah, and into the nation of the Jewish people. And then of course, the second thing he says is about the blessings. If the idea of the holidays are to bring blessing, so they must mimic the uh, the, the, the iconic blessing of the Jewish people. It's called the priestly benediction, Birkat Kohanim. Yevarecha Hashem Yishmarecha. May God bless you and watch over you. That is Pesach, because on Pesach it's Lel Shimurim. That first night God watched over us, and even today, by the way, on the first the Seder night we still call it Lel Shimurim. And it's the only night of the year you don't have to say Kriyat Shema on Al Hamita on the bed because you don't need to be more guarded than you necessarily are. Um, because normally we do that to guard us in various ways before we go to sleep. It's not necessary on Shavuot night, uh, on Pesach night. If you want, you can say Shema, but you definitely don't say the whole thing. Um, but you don't even have to because it's a Lel Shimurim on that night as long as you said Shema. In Marv. So, um, <clears throat> this idea of Shmira of Pesach, God watches over us because we just starting, just like children. The parent wants to watch over the children until they have the ability to know who they are and where they're going, right? That's called Pesach. Shavuot is Ya'er Hashem Panavalecha. God wants to show his countenance, to shine his countenance upon us and be gracious unto us. That graciousness is giving us the Torah, giving us the ability to understand things which normally is above the natural realm. It's being gracious. And the third thing, which is called Sukkot, is called Yisa Hashem Panavelecha, may God lift his countenance towards you and give you peace, because the idea of Sukkot eventually, which is also futuristic, and the 70 offerings for the 70 nations, and the rebuilding of the temple of the Sukkot David is also called Sukkot Shalom, this idea of bringing peace into our world. So we're living in a time where we definitely need Pesach. We need protection at this time. But it's, in a sense, it's not enough to have protection. We need introspection. We need to think of this process, what we're going through, and how we want to see it land up. And for that, we need Machshava, we need thought, which is Shavuot. And then we need to know how to reboot and re and take the correct steps that we bring a world of peace and not a world of turmoil and not a world which is all by economics because as we all know what's happening today is not um as we would say in english is not just an act of heaven i mean this pandemic started because people were using unsanitary conditions and eating certain wildlife, which you wonder why they did in such ways, were totally uh, what we call inhumane uh, in treatment to our animals. So you know, we like, I mean, God is involved in everything that man does, but the blame in this in very often is on mankind. As it says, And therefore what we have to do is we have to try to act, understand how to mend the world how to set our ways correctly so that tomorrow it will be a different world and a better world. So these are times of introspection and thinking. I wish everybody Chag Sameach V'Kasher, and maybe this be a Pesach of Shmirah, of protection, 
uh, from now and all through the year. Amen. Shalom. Shalom.